This week we're looking at Psalm 16. You'll look up there, it says, no fear for, uh, for all the excellent ones. Uh, it'll, hopefully that'll make sense at some point and Mel will probably come up with a better title than that later on. That was just one I quickly fought up yesterday because I always have to come up with a title. I don't know why, sometimes Psalm 16 would have done. Uh, for it. But this psalm has been selected for us uh, by Susan, and it's a great psalm. And she shared with us in, in, to help me to prepare for this, and also as a reason for it being her favourite psalm, that this was a very uplifting psalm for her. And she also apologised, saying that she couldn't remember where any of the quotes she put down came from. And I thought it was amazing, Susan, because you came up with quotes from three different Bibles. It was pretty good. I thought to myself, wow, uh, that's pretty amazing. So you had a quote from the Good News Translation, a quote from the NIV, and a quote from either the ESV or the New King James Version. I don't know which one. It could have been one of about 15 others as well. But it was definitely from a third version, which I thought was rather impressive. And you shared with us that you felt that, for instance, the first thing you gave us was that this, this talked to you about the importance of meeting together face to face as God's people. And you quoted from verse three, how excellent are the Lord's faithful people. My greatest delight is to be with them. That's from the Good News translation. Then you said how you felt that this psalm showed you how much you had to be thankful for. And quoting from verse six, the boundary lines for me have fallen in pleasant places. And that was from the NIV. And then you said, finally, uh, how this also spoke to you in terms of in spite of everything going on around us in the world, he, capital H, he, E, is something we can hold fast to because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. And that was, that was from the ESV, the New King James Version, or whichever version it was that you had obviously memorised it from. I thought it was pretty impressive that you couldn't remember where those quotes had come from, but you'd managed to get them word for word perfect in your email. So be, I was very impressed by that because uh, I struggle to remember verses. I remember the concepts, but sometimes the verses I miss. And everything you said were good points that, were, that are definitely going to be heard about today as we explore this psalm. But we're going to see there's a lot more in there that we can discern and learn from. So let's start by rereading it from the beginning, all 11 verses. And this is from the English Standard Version. Psalm 16, a miktam of David. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he, he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh, flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So a great psalm there that we're going to look deeply into. And there is an awful lot in this psalm. It's fantastic. And again, I could speak for hours on this. Uh, there are sections of it which are sublime in terms of the language used, but also what they tell us about God and our relationship with God and what we can experience for our relationship with God through faith. 
And so there's an awful lot that we can take from this. However, let's start by looking at the background to this psalm, the background. We start off with this simple fact. It's a miktam of David. Now, this isn't the only psalm that is actually called a miktam of David. We can also see up there that it's Psalm 16, but also Psalms 56 to 60. And last week, if you were here, you would have heard me talk about the fact that sometimes I used to read Psalms when I was scared. Interestingly, it was Psalms 56 to 60 that I used to turn to when I felt scared when I was a young lad away from home for the first time. And so... Uh, and so it's, 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 it's not something that's unusual, it's something that we see elsewhere in the Bible. But the real time, the real life timing of this psalm is actually quite difficult to place. We're not actually given the occasion of the psalm, however the psalm is marked of David and we have confirmation that it is of David in Acts 2.25 and Acts 13.35. Now I say that because there are people who think although it's marked as a victim of David it wasn't actually written by David but we believe in the inherent word of God, the infallible word of God. Therefore if the apostles thought it was written by David and wrote that in our Bibles then we believe it was written by David, or at least I do. You can argue about that with me if you wish to. As I've said, we can't place this. The chances are it was either written at a time early in David's reign, at a time of relative peace, reflecting on things that had happened before, or it was written later in life, closer to his death. Now, that's due to references that are given later on in the psalm, but I can't give you any definitive answer as to when it was written or why it was written. However, the title Amictum, I believe, can help us because some sort of scholars suggest this has the sense of making it a silent prayer, a silent prayer with the hand covering the mouth. And so basically David finds himself in a situation where something is happening about him, where he can't pray openly. And so he covers his mouth and he cries out to God, a plea. And then later on he wrote about how he felt because of that, there's, there's a sense of that in it. There is another feeling and another interpretation that the word mikta means golden as well. So it could mean a covering or it could mean golden. And therefore, some scholars will tell you that this is a golden psalm. It's full of things that can, full of golden words that can inspire us. So that sense, although I believe it's actually the silent prayer, I think that actually is a much better interpretation of the word. And also it makes sense because it makes sense in light of, of Psalms 56 to 60, which similarly do the same sort of thing. David cries out to the Lord as if something is happening, something that he's struggling with. With that in mind, the main theme of the psalm centres on David's single-minded devotion and confidence in his Lord, both, both now and in his future eternally, and a rejoicing in all he has experienced and will experience through faith in his Lord. And this will be conveyed in the form of a prayer that is quietly yet confidently expressed to the Lord for all the benefits he gives to the believer and a confident rejoicing in the expectation of a continued walk with the Lord on the path of life now and in eternity. And the divisions of the psalm actually follow this progression of the argument. Uh, the, and the psalm reveals an inner structure. So we've got, in verses one to four, we're gonna start off with confidence, a, a, a silent prayer that leads to him extolling that he has confidence in the Lord, in the situation that he is going through. Then it moves to a B, where he's gonna go on about the experience of faith, how he experiences through his faith, God's blessedness to him in what he sees around him. Then he goes back in verses seven to eight to, to a statement of confidence again in the Lord, this time in the future, focusing on the future. And then he's going to talk about the experience of faith again, focusing on the future in a sense. And so we've got this A, B, A, B 
structure there within the psalm. And as previously stated, something that's very important in this psalm uh, is that uh, we're going to see the psalm actually quoted in the New Testament. We see it quoted in Acts chapter 2, verses 25 to 28. So Psalm 16, verses 8 to 11 is quoted there by Peter. And Psalm uh, verse 10 is, is quoted by Paul in Acts 13, 35. And both Peter and Paul are going to vo- focus on verse 10 as prophetic. So this psalm is not just David speaking as a believer, his experience of God. It's also a prophetic word. By faith, he catches a glimpse of what God is going to do in the future through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And we have to be aware of that when we read the psalms. As Christians, we tend to read the psalms in the light of Christ. And so it's very easy for us to spot Christ in there and the lessons that Christ has made because obviously Jesus knew the Psalms and used them uh, himself. Uh, He's in a lot of what he says or what Jesus teaches fits with what the Psalms teaches us as well because obviously he's God. Therefore, if the Psalms are inspired, then Jesus would be in harmony with them. So we can see that, but we see a prophetic justification of Christ's resurrection in this psalm. So let's get into the text. Let's look at this and let's try and see what we can learn from it that takes us a little bit deeper into it. And we're going to start with the first section, confidence in the Lord, verses one to four. Now the psalm starts with a plea. Let me read it to you first. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. And so it starts with a plea. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. Now we have here a prayer that very much has a sense of danger and jeopardy in it, whilst at the same time being delivered with a single-minded mindset. Preserve me, O God, for it is only you in whom I can take refuge. It's single-minded, single-minded. There's no sense in David's mind that there is anybody else at this moment to which he should call out to. Now, as I said, we don't know the situation, but it is urgent enough that David is sending up an urgent SOS to the only person who, as I've said, he single-mindedly knows can help him. God, Al. See there, the original Hebrew is God, El, which means to the mighty, almighty, the almighty God, the only one who can save him in this situation. We don't know whether there was an army railed against him, whether it was rebels at court or whatever, but we know that he cries out to God, his almighty. Notice it's not Yahweh there. He's actually giving God a specific characteristic as the almighty. You are the almighty God. You are my refuge. You are my strength. You are my power. You are the one I turn to when I need those things. You are the only place I can come to in this emergency. And so David places himself into God's hand, as we all should in such a similar situation. If you are a man of woman of faith, If you are experiencing tough times, it is to God's almighty hand that you should place yourself where you should go for rest and to find the strength and the power to get through. Now, he's going to continue to expand on how total this trust and and how how much he has placed himself into God's hands in the next verse, verse, verse two up there, where he's going to complete what is a triumvirate of God's names or titles. Remember, he's already given one name. So we've already got 
name number one. But now we get God's name number two. We get Yahweh, Lord, the self-existent or eternal, the Jewish national name for God. So he's calling out to the God El, the mighty almighty, the self-existent or eternal. And then he ends it with Adonai, Lord, the supreme power over this universe. And by doing it in a free like that, he's completing God. He is showing completely who it is he trusts in. There's so many ways we can interpret the completeness of what he does here using the three names. But it is a complete and total vision of God that he gets when he cries out to God. It's not just one aspect of God's character. He sees all of God's character at work. And so it is from him and only him, only him, as he says, I have no good apart from you. It is from him and only him who he gets his very existence and joy. It is where all of his good comes from. Or as we know, the word good is derived from the word God. That is where he gets all of it from. His God, Yahweh, God El, the mighty self-existent, eternal, supreme power of the universe, his God, the God of the Jews, our God, the Christian God. David is basically proclaiming here, I cannot get through this without you, Yahweh. Without the almighty, eternal and supreme ruler of this universe, I am nothing. Everything I value, I depend on you. I trust in you and you alone. And we're going to see this trust further shown in the next verses by a deep committed love for God's people who are going to be contrasted with those who run after other pagan gods. Let's read it out to, to ourselves. He goes on in verses, verses three and four there. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply their drink offering to blood. I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. And it's really interesting the word used here. God's people are described as saints in the land. Saints in the land. And that's a really, really interesting phrase for him to use because the Hebrew word for saints is actually kadosh. And the word itself could mean sacred, sacred, as in morally or ceremonially sacred. It could mean God in terms of his eminence or a lofty position. It could mean angels, which is actually what it's most often translated as. If you see the word kadosh in the original Hebrew in lots of places, it will be translated as angels because that's how it's used. It could mean a sanctuary, or it could be used to mean holy ones, saints, you, me, all of us gathered here today. Holy ones, those who have been set apart for God. Now, in this instance, we can rule out God and his angels. Very, very simple reason for that, because it says, in the land. And so we have a description of an earthly residence, the place where they live. God and the angels live in heaven. It's obviously not the sanctuary because that is a place, a building. And uh, it's not referring to sacred either, but it is talking about the holy ones, those who live here on this earth and follow God, those who have been set apart from God. We have an earthly residence here, in a sense, not a heavenly one. And so it's talking about the saints, holy ones, Yahweh's people, those who have put their faith in Yahweh, God's people, those set apart from God, holy ones, hence saints. And David is drawn to them as excellent ones. Excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Now, the word for excellent is a beautiful word. I was looking at this word and delving into it, and I had 20 minutes of sermon I could have given you just on this one word. I could have spent ages here. And back six years ago, when I first started preaching, that's what we would have done. We would have concentrated on that little phrase and you would have had an entire sermon on it, jumping all over the place. We don't do that anymore because we go through the pas a passage instead. That's, we've changed, we do things better. Uh, 
But the word used for excellent is arrière, which literally means wide or a general sense of largeness, gen wide or large. And figuratively, it means powerful, excellent, famous, gallant, glorious, goodly, lordly, mighty or mightier one, noble, principal, worthy. I mean, look at those words. Don't you like the idea? David's looking out at you guys and he's seeing that in you. He's seeing you as powerful, excellent, famous, gallant, glorious, goodly, lordly, mighty, and noble, principal, and worthy. And those are all words that if you go to the New Testament, we could apply to Christians quite easily. As we share in the glory of Christ, we see in our fellow believers. Even the word famous, when we shine Jesus out, we are shining his fame out. So we see famous ones. You can just look at these words and just, they're just beautiful in what they are actually expressing. But the word itself is even better than that because it's actually derived from a, another word. Because its roots word is ada, which literally talks of expansion. And so there's this idea of a light shining out. And it's a wide or large light. You can see it. It's absolutely, it's just beautiful. And so it talks, figuratively, it talks of something magnificent. That which becomes glorious or honourable. And isn't that true? We share in the glory of Christ. We shine his glory out. And it is Jesus that makes us honourable. We, we are honoured before God and the angels because of what Jesus has done within us. There's so much there we can talk about and ways we could take it. But it's quite an exciting idea to get that into your heads when you think about yourself, but also when you think about God's people. If you've ever been through the experience that some of us have had in the past of walking into church and being rejected, these words are a great comfort. I've told the story many times of work placement when I was studying at college and I was at the dinner table and the pastor's wife, we, the pastor turned to his wife and said, I'll be bringing these two students into the old people's home this week. And she leant forward and in front of her son and the pastor, she said, I'm not having that in my old people's home. And she pointed at me. My fellow students were... They, 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 they knew me. They knew who I was. The pastor was like, <gasps> the son spent two hours that afternoon apologizing to me. She had got it in her head that because of my outward appearance, my inner self was not a reflection of God. That evening I gave my testimony at church. She came up to me afterwards and apologized. She said, I'm so sorry for what I said. After listening to your testimony, and seeing you talk about God, I know you are saved. I am sorry for what I said. She didn't see the excellence that Jesus had done for me. She wasn't looking for the glory of Christ. She wasn't looking inside, she was looking outside. How many times have we done that when we've come to church and not thought to ourselves, wow, these are the excellent people of God. I delight in them no matter what they look like, sound like, smell like. I was listening to R.C. Sproul this morning and R.C. Sproul said, be, you know, he was basically saying, be careful when you're around other Christians. Remember, all of us are on the path of sanctification. Some get things quicker than you in one area, whereas sometimes you get things quicker in an area that they take a long time to get. Try remembering that. But David, when he looks out, he is so focused on God that all he sees is the excellence of God's people and he delights in it. He looks out, he sees God's people loom large. They're a delight to him because he sees the glory of God emanating from them because of their faith and trust in their Lord, Yahweh. And for the Christian, we know that this should be so because our Lord prayed that it would be so. Here's a great quote from you from the Bible. Um, let me pull it up, it should be there, there it goes. Jesus, when he prayed for all believers, prayed this in John. 
And he says this, Jesus prays for all believers. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through, through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Jesus is praying that we will get a sense of his glory, but also that we will share in his glory and it will be visible to the world. So how much more so should it be visible to each of us, us who know Christ, that we see Christ in our fellow believers and therefore we see the glory of God because that is what David is seeing. As he looks out in this moment of trouble, he sees, imagine he's in his courtroom he puts his hands over his lips. He feels so alone. He cries out to God and he, then he looks up and around the room, he sees his fellow people of faith standing with him in that room, shoulder to shoulder, shining out for God. That's a pretty amazing thing to, 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 to just think about. David may be surrounded on all sides, but as he looks out, he sees bright lights burning all around him, the saints, and it makes him happy. Yahweh is at work. In stark contrast, he points to those who follow other gods. He points to them. He says, the sorrow of those who run after another god shall multiply their drink offerings of blood. I will not pour out or take my, their names on my lips. He states how all they will find, those who follow other gods, all they're going to find is sorrows that multiply. Their sacrifices are empty. Their God's names so worthless and their practices so evil that no man of God such as he should have anything to do with them. Now, this last bit is where I, I, we see that. I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. He could be talking there about the names of the very gods they follow. He will not have anything to do with the gods they follow. But he might also be talking about the very people who are following those gods. I will not have their names on my lips. I will have nothing to do with them in that sense. Now, that's not me saying we should isolate ourselves from the world. But he is saying that those who follow other gods and try to get you to follow other gods, try to get you to do what they would do, you should have nothing to do with. And that was what we talked about last week in Psalm 2, and we talked about a little bit in Psalm 1. So much in there. David is so happy when he sees God's people, but when he's amongst the world, he knows they are not his people. He knows he must be careful. He knows that. And this is an extreme statement of confidence in the Lord. He confidently knows this, but now he's going to move on to an expression, the experience of faith. It says there, the Lord is my chosen portion of my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. David shows a little more of why he's confident the Lord is a sure place to place one's trust rather than in the false gods of this world. And it comes through this experience of faith. And to do this now, he's going to use language that is reminiscent of the promises made to the Levites, the priestly tribe of Israel, when they entered Canaan during the Exodus. And he's going to quote, in a sense, he's quoting from Numbers 18.20, Deuteronomy 10.9, and Deuteronomy 18.1. One of those uh, verses is this one here, Numbers 18.20. And the Lord said to Aaron, you shall have no inheritance in their land, neither shall you have any portion among them. I am your portion and your inheritance among the people of God. When 
the nation of Israel passed into the land at the Exodus, after the Exodus, when they, when they actually went in after 40 years of wandering around, the land was divided up amongst the tribes of Israel. Now, technically, there were, there were 12 tribes, but one of those tribes was the Levites, and they were set apart for God to take care of God's things, such as the, the, the tabernacle, things like that. And so they weren't allocated land that could be passed down from generation to generation. But instead, Yahweh was to be their portion, their inheritance. And so David here, when he talks about this, he's, he's, he's using similar language. He's basically saying, the Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. He's not pinning his hopes on the provision of earthly riches of land, which yes, as king he has, and yes, when Israel in relationship with God followed God, they were blessed in the land. And when the Israelites were blessed in the land, guess what? So were the Levites, because the Levites were given a tenth. The tithe to the Lord was theirs to use, everything of the Lord's. But what David is saying here, that my, my faith, therefore, is not in those things. It's not in the land. It's not in my riches. It's in God. It's in my faith in you, Lord. And then he goes on to say that his experience of this faith is both pleasant and beautiful. It has brought him contentment and security that nothing else can. I've shared this quite a bit since I've moved here. And you might think, this is not me trying to get anything from anybody. I want to praise God for his amazingness. Me and Mel actually live on less money I was get than, than I was getting when I was the youth pastor at Emmanuel Baptist Church. Interestingly, since I moved here as an act of faith, knowing that the church couldn't pay me, I've been living on less money, but I've always felt rich. When you put your trust in God, he makes ends meet for you, even when you have nothing. I've also told the story of the, the greatest gift I was ever given. It was a gift of five pounds from Lenny. Lenny had spent the last 40 years of his life on the dole. He had never been able to work. He was the most uneducated man you would, you would ever meet, but he had become a Christian. And he gave me a five pound note. It was the smallest gift I received that year, but it was the one that was worth the most to me because Lenny gave out of love for me as a fellow Christian. It was amazing. Oh, it's just the most beautiful thing. When we trust in God, small things become bigger. Small things go further. You're more contented with what you have rather than what you haven't got. As Von Rad says, Yahweh is the asylum, a place of haven, retreat, and rest in his arms. We often think of asylums as places we shut people up in, but an asylum was always a place you went for protection, for rest, and you had to rely on the asylum for everything because you would have nothing. That is God, that is where we go. And when we do that, then like the Levites, we will feel content, content. That's the experience of faith. When you step out in faith for the Lord, he will return that to you with contentment, rest, and his blessings, and even more blessings to come in a later life. He now moves on with this mindset, he has such a God-centered mindset that as he talks about this, there's something he cannot help but do. And it's something he's going to do confidently in the Lord. He is now going to praise God and bless the Lord. And he says this, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. And what's he do here? This, and I'm going to be quick with this because I've got to get to the last bit, which is actually really important. 
He praises God for the counsel he gives. Notice God does not coerce him. There's no coercion going on with God. God is not, co- is not forcing David to say what he is doing or forcing him to live the life he is living. David has to do this voluntarily. But he listens to, the God's, count- to God's counsel and because of that he does it because he knows that God is God. However, although God does not coerce, he will point things out because he instructs us. He says sometimes this is what you should be doing and you're not very good at it, Tony. So sort it out, mate. Sometimes he will do that and he will do it at the times where it's sometimes the most inconvenient. He does it at night, a quiet time of reflection. How many times have you tossed and turned because God has pointed something out to you? And so we start reflecting on it at the time of day when we've got time to reflect on it. That's what happened to David as well. David's in the same shoes as you. He's, this is a hero of faith talking and he's got the same characteristics as all of us. He does similar things to us. And it happens in the innermost place in his conscience. His conscience is struck by the counsel that God's given, the instructions that God's given, that his conscience is pricked. And that could be the heart or the kidneys in that sense. There's a rumbling in his stomach and it's telling him, boy, you need to listen to what God is telling you. However, because of this, He is confident about something. He is confident that the Lord is always before me because he is at my right hand. And that phrase right hand is really important. In olden days, if you had a bodyguard, he would stand on the right hand side of you, that side. The idea was that if anybody came at you because you would normally walk on the left, Uh, side of the street and they would be on the right side if someone came at you he could draw his sword to protect you that was the idea and so David is talking here about his right hand man the man who protects him but he doesn't just protect him at his right hand side he also leads him daily he's a bodyguard you've seen the bodyguards i was once kofi annan at dubai airport kofi annan was coming towards me he was a united nations guy at the time big chief coming towards me mel's on the other side of the thingy i don't know what she was doing but i was looking at i was going blimey that's kofi annan and his bodyguard literally shoved me out the way and i could see kofi annan kind of looking at me going that guy just recognized me Uh, and my bodyguard has just shoved him out and as he walked past his head looked and he smiled (laughs) You know, he'd been protected from that idiot who had just stood there like a... uh, The bodyguard just shoved me out of the way. He was going before him. Get out of the way, mate. Follow me, Kofi. You're safe with me. And that's what David felt with God. Completely and totally safe with God because his God was at his right hand like a bodyguard. And because of that, he shall not be moved. I shall not be shaken and this is again a confident statement as the result of a godly mindset you see that phrase i shall not be shaken i shall not be moved is the literal translation on its own it sounds arrogant but when you apply it to somebody who humbly has faith in god it is a statement of confidence in the one who is in charge of your life and that is what david is sharing with us there the experience of faith The psalm of confidence now moves to its conclusion with verses 9 to 11, which say this. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Now, we love a good therefore. And therefore is an opportunity to reflect on what has been written before and learn the lessons and apply them. And that is what David is going to do to end this psalm. He's going to give us meaningful lessons we can learn from what has already been written. And he starts there with those words, which I've highlighted on the screen for you guys, which I've already read out a moment ago. In the midst of the struggle or crisis before him, our writer's heart is glad, his whole 
being rejoices. His fears are eclipsed by hope and trust that the Lord cares for him in both his life and death. This is a relationship that will not end. My whole being rejoices, my flesh dwells secure. You will not abandon my soul to Sheol. You will not let your Holy One see corruption. What a great statement there. Sheol was kind of a place of darkness. It was kind of, it was kind of the rubbish heap. Uh, it was not a place you really wanted to go to. And as a person of faith, none of us will ever go there. The Bible is clear on that. David is talking about that. This, this, this relationship he has with God is eternal. It's not going to end. And that must have been an incredible comfort to him as a person as he was surrounded by danger. I could go out tomorrow and someone could run me over because I'm a Christian. They could say, as a Christian, I'm going to knock him over. Do you know what? I'm going to heaven. Have your way, mate. Have your way. I'm not going to stand there in front of the car and let you do it. I might try to jump out of the way. But have your way. I do not fear you. Because I know this relationship I have with God will not end. I know where I am going. However, there is something deeper here in this passage that we must be careful not to overlook as I read it. Because yes, David wrote this. And when David wrote this, he obviously had a glimpse of the Messiah in a sense, but we know that he was writing this about his present situation. But when the disciples read this, they could see Christ clearly in there for clear reasons. And both Paul and Peter are going to use verses from verses 8 to 11, in particular verse 10. And if you can look closely at the words, you can see why this is viewed prophetically. David's words in verse 10 are too strong to be simply reverting to himself, his own resurrection. Why do I say that? Because David had no expectation of not dying. We know that. When David wanted to build the temple, what did God say to him? You will not build my temple. Instead, your son will build my temple. David knew he wasn't going to last forever. David knew that one day his body would be laid to rest. It would see corruption in the worldly sense. One day, if Jesus doesn't come back soon, I will be laid to rest. However perfect my body is at that time, my wife will tell you my body is not perfect in any shape or form. She's always getting little ointments and creams to try and eat things off my body. But neither does the idea of being buried and the worms and the maggots eating my flesh. But one day that is the, is the sense of what's going to happen. My body will see corruption. So will the saints that David is seeing from his window or in his court. They one day will see corruption. However, as Paul states in Acts 13, 37, after quoting these words, he says this, but he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Who's he talking about? He's talking about our Lord and Savior, Jesus, Jesus. It, only he who God raised did not see corruption, Jesus. And then Peter says this in Acts 2.24, where these verses, again, are mentioned. It says this, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for, for him to be held by it. In fact, what Peter is saying is that it was impossible for Jesus to be held by by death. It was impossible for death to hold him, the son of God. And so David is not talking about himself here. We get a vision of Jesus. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. David, a man of faith, 
He was someone who had a future hope. We know that because we see that in 2 Samuel 7 when he talks about the temple, but also we hear about it in Hebrews 11, which talks about this. And it was grounded in God's promises given, covenantal promises given to David about what would happen in the future. And so by using this language, he was not only rejoicing in his present reality, but also prophetically predicting one greater than he who would fulfill these words more completely. And he rejoiced in its future effects upon his own death and eternal destination. Because of Christ's death, David will not be abandoned to Sheol. In a sense, this holy one will not see corruption because one day, as like us, he will get his new body and he will live eternally where we will not see corruption. No more bad bad knees. I I don't know, but I think we've got a congregation of bad knees today. I don't know whether it's, or bad legs then, (laughs) and feet. Yes, we've got hobblers. (laughs) You won't have that, it's gone. You'll be made perfect. My moles will all be cleared up. Think about that. No more in living in fear of my wife wanting to burn them off. I will see perfection. I will never again see corruption because of the one who has not seen corruption, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus. These are the prospects. He talks about the prospects that are opened up by the death. Christ's death, a ransom paid once and for all for your sin and the resurrection of Christ, God's mighty amen to our Lord's proclamation on the cross of it is finished, the price has been paid, are awesome because they open up the way, as it says in these final verses, it opens up the way to the path of life in whom's presence we can have fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. Where will we experience that in its fullness? In the presence of God at the end. I say to you today, if this is your favourite psalm, it is a great psalm to have as your favourite psalm. Because as we lurch in our present lives from emergency to crisis, every day this psalm helps us to remember that the God-centred man need fear nothing. As David prayed, let us pray acknowledging our truly awesome God and rejoicing that one day there will be no more pain in his presence because of his son. David also showed us we can start to enjoy that now by looking at our fellow believers and praising God, enjoying their company, fellowship, all those things. It's a great psalm. Thank you for letting us preach on it today, Susan. Thank you for sharing it with us. And next week we'll be looking at another psalm, but let me pray and then I'll hand back to Mel. Father God, I do thank you and praise you, Lord, Lord, that that you're in charge of our lives. Thank you that we get a vision of you through your son, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you sent the spirit into our lives to open our eyes to your glory. Thank you for for that, Lord. And help us now to live daily, confidently walking with you, expressing our faith through the experience of you that we are so blessed to have here in advance of the amazing life we are going to have when we finally reach glory with you, Lord. Help us to live in the light of that, Lord. And so I just hand this to you, Lord, and ask you to to bless our hearts this week, Lord Jesus. Bless our walk with you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen.